for, yeah, for the recording the and just stand. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Hey, everybody. This is Devin, GCNWSP president. Um, we're super excited to have this. I mean, for multiple reasons. Obviously, these two are amazing, amazing uh, local business owners, but also this is our first in person meeting since 2021. So, you know, give everybody a round of applause for coming in person. This feels so much better than being on Zoom. No offense to everybody on Zoom. I feel so much better being out here and seeing, with, seeing you all and connecting with you all. So what we're gonna do is we have a couple of things to get out of the way first. Um, we need to approve the minutes and reports for GC and NAACP. So if there aren't any objections from our members in attendance, we're gonna approve those minutes and reports. So we're just gonna give a second for everybody to chime in if anybody has anything to say. All right, we good? Yep. Okay, cool. All right, the next thing we like to do is for every monthly meeting, we like to play our uh, branch anthem, which happens to be lift every voice and sing. Um, so, you know, either sing your hearts out or hum along, whatever you feel comfortable with. We're going to play that on the screen here in just a second. Thank and take it away. And if everyone would rise as you're able in the room. Um, there we go. Black. Is everybody seeing it? Now I've got to dive into. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound. Now for our introduction of our presentation tonight, Daryl and Haley are the owners of Meadow Mountain Hemp, located in Accident, Maryland. As one of the first industrial hemp growers in Maryland, they are dedicated to the growth of premium hemp and therapeutic and industrial purposes. With global experience and training in agriculture and science, Daryl and Haley are passionate about restoring a struggling agricultural community by the way of industrial hemp and sustainability. With current focus on CBD for health and wellness, the duo is also spearheading efforts in the county to revitalize the hemp fiber industry. As farmers, they believe in sustainability and in organic growing to ensure their hemp plants are natural and healthy for both consumers and the planet. And without further ado, here's Haley and Darren. We need to stand up here. Um, no, not necessarily. Okay. Do, do you want me to put up the slides? Yeah, that'd be great. All right. uh, those of us on Zoom won't be able to see you unless you stand there, though. Okay. I'll no. stand there. No, we can, we, can, we, can move, we can move the camera. Yeah. That's not a... I'm just going to open with an apology to everyone online. We both walk and talk, so we might be popping in and out of the camera. Um, trying to set up a screen share. Sam, can you make me a screen share? Well, I'll start out by thanking you all for coming out and uh, coming to hear about hemp and the marijuana industry that's coming here uh, in July. Haley and I are uh, so excited to share our story and what we're doing here in the county and how we're trying to improve the agricultural community here uh, with this simple plant. So. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, 
the future of hemp and how we see it and what we're currently doing here in Bear County. Take your way, Hale. Awesome. Yeah, that works. Um, I don't think we're sharing the screen, are we? Um, can those online see the slides? No, no, they can't. They didn't get an option to share the screen. Um, everybody has permission to share. Okay. We can at least do it this. this. Technology. Yeah. <laughs> Always fine. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it's just a right. right. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. 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 Sorry. Oh, we can do our intros. Yeah. 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 All right. Sure. So my name is Daryl Galapoli. I grew up here um, on the family farm that we're currently farming on. So it's pretty special that we got to come back here and start a business on the family farm. Um, before coming back to Garrett County in 2020, uh, Haley and I were living in D.C. after our stint in the U.S. Peace Corps. So we served in Peace Corps Tanzania from 2013 to 2016 as science educators and agricultural educators. Um, I think that's really the reason why we decided we want to live this lifestyle and come back here and farm and really do something to affect change in our community and for, uh, for the betterment of agriculture in the United States. So this was a perfect opportunity and, uh, you know, yeah, go ahead, Haley, you can do your... Yeah, so now we have our presentation back up. We are here to talk about hemp, the hemp industry, and also... Oh, Haley, let's back up. You didn't give her background, so oh, yeah. I'm gonna, sorry. I'm apologies for that. All right. Yes, my name is Haley Gustafson. I am a Garrett County transplant. I moved here in May of 2020, so I like to say that I'm officially a Garrett County in three years under my belt. Mm -hmm. and I think I originate from California. I'm born and raised, raised on the West Coast, and like Daryl said, in 2013, we both left to Tanzania to join the Peace Corps, which is where we actually met each other fell in love, all that cute Aww. stuff. I uh, did long distance relationship, our whole service out there and came back, lived in DC and decided to do hemp. So we moved here three years ago. And we could be happy. We could be happy here. Yeah, Thank we you. could be happy. So as we probably mentioned multiple times, uh, we're here to talk about hemp, the hemp industry and the future of the cannabis industry for Maryland with recreation coming this year. So we're gonna start off with the basics. What is hemp? This is our bread and butter. This is what we grow, we eat it, we live it, we breathe it, everything. Um, hemp is cannabis. If there's anything you get from this presentation, hemp is cannabis. Hemp is not marijuana. It's not marijuana. They are two completely different things. They are from the same species. They are both in the cannabis family. Hemp is a variety of cannabis sativa L. It is a dioecious plant. Anyone know what dioecious means? Educate us. <laughs> Go for it, Carol. Yeah, so this means there's male and female plants. So you'll have a male plant that will pollinate the female plant and produce your seeds. Uh, we typically don't grow for, for seed production with our CBD crop, but we'll talk a little bit more about seed production with hemp fiber. Mm -hmm. So within the cannabis family and hemp plants, you can find a lot of things called cannabinoids. These are the phyto compounds found naturally in cannabis. So when we grow CB or when we grow hemp, we find things like CBD, THC, and then maybe some you haven't really heard before, such as CBC, CBN. The list goes on and on and on. There are hundreds of cannabinoids, and there's still some that are needing to be discovered that we just don't know enough about yet. Um, yep. Yeah, one more thing about the, the cannabinoids. Uh, the cool thing about the science of marijuana is the and cannabis that these specific cannabinoids help to produce different effects within your body. So THC is going to be more for your pain relief, appetite, uh, increased appetite. CBD is going to be more for pain relief, anti-inflammatory. The underlying the underlying relationship between them all is that they're anti-inflammatory. But for example, CBG is going to be best used for gut health, uh, helping with inflammation in your bowels. So 
we're trying to figure out how we can use these specific cannabinoids to treat different ailments and then target those uh, target those specific cannabinoids in the breeding programs that they're doing. So maybe we're going to plant that will express more CBG than CBD. Maybe we'll get to express a little bit more CBN, which is for sleep. So uh, there's so many different cannabinoids within the plant. And as the science develops, we're going to be using these to specifically target certain elements that people may have. And something that's so interesting about hemp is you keep hearing CBD. The last five, maybe seven years, you've started to see CBD pop up everywhere. Like, what is this CBD? What is this hemp? What is this? This is not a new plant. This is not brand new to our knowledge, to America's knowledge, to the world's knowledge. This is an old school plant. Hemp history. Look at this picture. Wow. This was not taken last year. <laughs> This is probably the 1800s, maybe early 1900s. Exception, probably. Yeah. And they're harvesting hemp. Right. See how tall it is. Yeah. So a little bit about the history of hemp. Sailing mentioned before, this has been around for a long time. We've been cultivating hemp uh, since agriculture was developed back in the day. But in America, specifically in the colonial times, uh, Farmers were actually required to grow a certain allotment of hemp in their crops. That would be then sent back to Europe and England to be used in the fiber and textile and rope industries. Um, after that, we of course developed our own industry here in America, uh, which was bustling during, during the 1800s, 1900s even. Um, then we had something called the Cannabis Control Act in 1937, um, or Marijuana Tax Act, excuse me. That kind of banned anything related to or anything that looked like cannabis. So we lumped hemp with marijuana. Uh, there was lots of stigma actually attached to smoking marijuana uh, within the African American community specifically. So this was a way to target that. Um, with that, though, we lost we lost the whole industry. We lost uh, factories that produced the rope, uh, the, the fiber for textiles. It, it decimated the entire industry. Then World War II came, and we're like, oh, we need to grow hemp again. We need supplies. So again, the hemp was it called the hemp for, uh, for hemp for victory program in the 1940s uh, was basically used to uh, get farmers to grow the, this crop again so that they could supply uh, industrial materials for, for the army to make their bags, their, their clothing, their ropes, their parachutes. All of this was made from hemp. You'll notice um, if you see an old World War II outfit or a bag, they're still in really good condition. Wow. Pretty amazing because it's made of hemp. This stuff lasts a long time. It's strong fiber. Um, and it's amazing that we haven't been really using this. We've decided to use other alternatives, fibers like cotton that uh, require insane amounts of water and pesticides and fertilizer. So we're dumping that on our fields, getting it to grow, but we're also poisoning the earth while we're doing it. Hemp's a great alternative that we do not need those pesticides. We do not need that amount of fertilizer. We can do it all naturally and uh, really suppress the weeds without, you know, spraying all these chemicals all over the field. And that's really what we're trying to turn agriculture from, something that's destroying our soil to something that's really healing our soil and building that organic matter within it. Hemp's, hemp's one of the ways to, to do that. We're not saying everyone should just go out and grow hemp specifically only. This is going to be part of any farmer's crop rotation that they have in their, their farm. So they could still grow their corn, their soy, their hay, but hemp's going to be a great alternative once we have processing available here for farmers to sell the product to. Um, so a little bit further down the line here, um, 2014 Farm Bill comes out. This is actually the first law that actually allowed us to start growing hemp again. Uh, states like Kentucky uh, were at the forefront of this uh, with their pilot programs. Maryland did not have a pilot program until 2018. Uh, that was with the 2018 Farm Bill. So. Uh, with that bill, we then decided, okay, Maryland's got a pilot program, we can start growing. So in 2019, we we jumped into this industry and, and started growing our first crop. So why? Why, why did we just choose hemp? It's a great question. Uh, back when we were living in D.C., like I said, we moved up here in 2020. We actually started farming in 2019 with the help of our family, some who are here tonight. Hello. Shout out. Uh, yeah. Come on. So when we were living in DC, I love I have a lo lovely little story for everyone. 
Uh, Daryl and I, we went to the movie theater. This is pre-COVID. You know, you go to the movies, you sit in that recliner seat. I think we went to see Black Panther or something. Mm -hmm. And we got our soda, we got our popcorn share, a large soda. Daryl goes to reach for a straw, and I say, no. This was during the whole turtle thing that happened. Turtles, the straws in their nose. And I said, no. I also have a background in marine biology, so I'm so connected to the water. Um, I said, no. We, we thought about it. So watching this movie, we're like, there's got to be a way. I shouldn't have to take this big cup and drink like, straight yeah, from like it. Four, you know, he got annoyed with me because I said no straw. <laughs> but then that's where we had this light bulb pop in our heads. With hemp, we can make a hemp straw. Well, we can make, we can't even stop there. We can make a hemp cup that that wow. straw goes into. Why not stop there? But the popcorn's in, that could be made of hemp. Wow. So this kind of started to spiral us into this direction of hemp. How do we do it? How do we get into it? The Farm Bill Act came out in 2018. So we started growing in 2019. <clears throat> Why? Hemp is environmentally beneficial. Like Daryl mentioned, cotton, it takes a lot of water. Hemp don't need a lot of water at all. Grows a lot, e it grows very easily. We don't have to add pesticides or herbicides to it. It's a weed. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Um, so we don't add any chemicals or any toxins to our plants at all. It also helps eradicate deforestation and it helps reduce carbon emissions in the atmosphere, which we'll dive into a little later in the presentation. And it also improves soil quality and purifies water. So we saw it as a no-brainer. This is a new plant being revitalized in our, our, in our nation. Why not try it? So we did. So 2019, we started out growing 350 plants on a quarter acre. Not a lot. Sounds like a lot of plants, but a quarter acre is very small. But that's all we needed. It was a small business. We were in our start. We didn't really know what we were doing. We we're just figuring it out as we went. So we started small and now we're happy to say we grow a little over an acre every year. So every year we just started boosting it up, boosting it up. And we started to see the changes in our land and also the changes in our bodies as CBD consumers. A lot of stress comes in farming, but not if you use CBD. <laughs> CBD. Just admire that picture. <laughs> yeah, all of, so all the photos you see, these are all photos taking, taken from our farm over the last year or two. Most of them are from last season. So this is one of our beautiful, beautiful strains called Rocket Fuel. And you'll notice some of the leaves are turning purple. Once it gets a little bit cold, this plant starts to express this compound called uh, anthocyanin, which gives it that red look. So um, you get some purple buds, now you know why it's purple. It's typically because of the cold that causes that to happen. Some genetics will cause it to be purple, but uh, purpling for outdoors typically comes from the expression of anthocyanin and, and the cold that comes. So is it like half, half purple, half magenta? It's, yeah. it's just shade, different shades of purple. It's, yeah. It's also a little lighting effect. In the sun. <laughs> or, well, or, well. All right. so, yeah. But yeah, so for us, we started growing for CBD flower, and that's what we do today. Yeah, and you know, when when I started thinking about hemp in college, actually, uh, it was always with the, the mindset of fiber and industrial uses. CBD wasn't even wasn't even a thing that we talked about or knew about. That didn't come until 2014 when everyone realized, oh, we don't have anywhere to process hemp. So what are farmers like us supposed to do um, if you don't have a place to take your crop at the end of the season? That's why, you know, we say we only grow a quarter acre. It seems mind-boggling because, I mean, when you grow corn, you need to have acres upon acres upon acres to make any money. Um, we just didn't have, there wasn't anywhere to send it. So we would have done five on day one if we could have, but there's not processes. And that's what we've been trying to work on for the longest time. But uh, CBD was our end. That was our way we could start making some money in this. We could start uh, creating a career out of it and really start to figure out how how this industry works and where it's going to go. You want to take this one? Yeah, sure. So CBD, as you can see, we have our products up here. You see CBD everywhere. There's a lot of different products. These are only like some of the benefits. There's so many benefits of CBD and wellness for your body. First and foremost, it helps reduce anxiety, helps reduce stress. It is a sleep aid, you know, if you have what we call a gerbil brain at night, you lay down and 
those thoughts just race and race on the hamster wheel. It helps with that. It can also help with uh, intestinal issues or inflammation of the gut. It helps with uh, muscle aches and pains, you know, arthritis, joint pain, uh, workout recovery. It's all natural products that works in line with our bodies. Our bodies have a what we call an endocannabinoid system. This is a system that re regulates the whole body. CBD attaches right to that system through CB1 and CB2 receptors. So it's processed naturally in our bodies, especially if you have a nice pure CBD product, you're not gonna have any additives or any junk going into your body. It's completely natural, straight from the earth. Do you have anything to add? Um, that's something we have. We'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to dive into um, our process, at least for our farm, and how we get from point A to point B. Starts with planting. So, every year we replant our hemp plants. They do not grow back every year. Every year we plant, every year we cut them down. <laughs> so, this is what a planting looks like. We start our plants from seed in May. So we'll be starting them in the coming weeks. Uh, as you can see, we just use simple trays. We start them in a greenhouse indoors. So, you know, it stays warm here at County after all. And then about, what, about eight weeks? No, about four weeks. About four weeks, we get a nice little plant that looks like this, about six to eight inches high with a nice root system in it. And that's what we're putting right into the ground. You can see Daryl there in that second photo, planting. So we do everything by hand. We don't have any planting machines, no machinery. Um, and the reason for that is one, we don't have the machinery. And two, we like to follow our plants from the seed all the way through. So we touch every single one of our plants thousands of times in the summer through the whole process, just for that quality <laughs> assurance. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll mention the first couple of years we, we started out doing clones. Clone production, using clones was really beneficial, um, but it was really costly. Uh, we found we could get similar results by spending a third of the money on the starting process. Uh, so we switched to seeds two years ago, mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's been just fine, to be honest. But uh, the clones, clones are basically a, a cutting off of the plant that creates a genetically identical plant to the mother. Um, this creates... If you're doing a lot of different, or you're doing a single crop of CBD, say, for extraction, this will make all the plants finish at the same time because they're from the same plant. Sometimes with seeds, you'll have to, one plant might be further ahead of another one. You can't just cut them all on the same day. That's the only real difference that we, we've seen, really. Um, but with the trained eye, you can, you can find that this plant, you know, is done, this one's not. Um, early on, though, when we were just starting out and learning, the clones was really beneficial for us to keep everything really, really consistent across the board. Are your seeds from your last year plants? Oh, that's uh -huh. a good question. So we we source new seeds every year. Um, one thing to know about CBD plot, CBD hemp plants is they're all feminized. Mm -hmm. So we do not get seed production in our feminized fields. Mm -hmm. um, so now every year we go through reliable sources. There's a lot of companies out there selling seeds. So our first couple of years was a bit of trial and error, but we've been working with the same company for three years now. We like their genetics. We like their strains. Um, so that's what we use. Well, another thing I would mention about our planting is, like I said, we don't do any pesticides or herbicides, but we do put a lot of organic inputs in. So we use uh, fish emulsion and kelp emulsion. We also utilize chicken pellets or manure to give our not only our soil a good boost, but our root systems in our plants to give them a good start when they get into the ground. So we plant in June, like the first week of June, and then we let it grow. Let it grow. So it grows during the summer months, depending on the variety or the strain of hemp plant or the genetics. Uh, it takes around 120 days for it to reach full maturity and flowering. Some varieties can take 100 days, some 125 days, but 120 is more or less the average. So we plant the beginning of June, and then we harvest the end of September. And like Daryl said, because we do from seed, come September, we are constantly monitoring almost every single plant just to see if it's ready to pop. Um, so you can see here, these are, this is one of our fields here. 
these are probably in September. So it's a full bloom. And then this is a close up of one of the tops. This is the flower that we go to get. So there's two, two main uh, phases in growing. So we have the vegetative phase, which is going to be mostly just leaf production, growth of the, the stems, everything. Once we uh, get a 12 12 life cycle, so that'll happen at about the end of July when we have, uh, you know, 12 hours of night, 12 hours of daytime. Um, it's days are longer before that, so we're in vegetative phase during that. That 12 hour signals the plant to, to switch its gears to start flowering. Now, you're not going to get a flower overnight. It takes eight weeks to eight to nine weeks to reach maturity. So, once that happens uh, at the end of July, we have about till the end of September, beginning of October for, for harvest. That's kind of how we predict things with it. Um, but we'll start seeing changes in the plants about mid August after that 12 fill cycle hits. And it's just, it's a rapid production of flower after that. I will say that this, I don't know, it might be hard to see what an individual plant looks like, but come September, one of these plants is about yay high and about the span of my arms wide. So they're, they're chunky. <laughs> they're, they're a big girl. Yeah. yeah. They're beautiful <laughs> Christmas trees. Yeah. So come harvest time. Yeah. Right, girl. Yeah, come harvest time. Uh, like I said, we're making sure that the flowers are fully developed on the plants. Different strains are going to finish at different times, so we may harvest one two weeks before the other. Um, our CBG varieties typically finish first, so we can harvest those about the third week of September. Uh, that's just because their flowering period is much quicker. Um, so basically, yeah, we, like Kelly said, we do everything by hand. So we'll hand harvest, we take a uh, a weed whacker with a blade on it, and we whack down the plants, cut them down like trees. Um, then we break them down a little further. We like to keep the plants pretty well intact before we hang them. We found the first year we were cutting the plants so much that it just took so much time and it really didn't make sense to be wasting all that time. Uh, so we'll typically cut the top off, which is gonna be your thickest uh, flower or largest flower, um, and then hang the rest of the plant up. So we'll hang these pieces separately. Yeah, so our first year, 2019, I said we did about 350 plants. Last year, we came out with about 1,500 plants. Um, so this is this field here. It looks like a daunting task, mm -hmm. I know, but it doesn't have to all be done in one day. As long as it's not raining, we can do it over the span of a couple of days. Actually, last year's harvest, it was... <laughs> yeah, we got COVID and like, oh, like, everyone stay away. We'll harvest on our own. But it actually worked out okay. We did it in about two days, so not a big deal. Not a big deal. So once we cut them out of the field and break them down, as Daryl said, we take them to our barn, which we retrofitted as a hanging space and a drying space for our flowers. So once you cut from the field, you have about two hours to get that plant hung or set up somewhere that it can start drying. If you don't, it starts to mold and then you lose that plant. Right. So over the past couple of years, with the help of family and friends and volunteers coming out to help with harvest, we figured out the system that keeps it flowing and working. And we're pretty confident that this year we're gonna have an excellent harvest. So once they get cut out, like I said, we take them to the barn. So this is a piece of what our barn looks like. I have a little uh, fast forward. So that's our hanging. Essentially we have trellis netting that goes across our barn. We have multiple rows, about 20 rows of this trellis netting. We pull it out like a shower curtain. And then we make um, hooks in the stalks of our plants to hang them in that trellis netting. So it takes time. We don't move this fast. <laughs> so we found we, we were using the trellis netting the first couple of years. We started using uh, this deer fence uh, to hang it. It's a little stronger, uh, holds the plants a little better. Um, but both both ways have worked fine. We've been able to use that that trellis setting. Actually, that's the third season we've used it. So. Mm -hmm. And mind you, our first season, we paid $5,000 to dry our stuff in a subpar environment and got moldy bud back. Oh. So spending the money on doing it ourselves was well worth it. And that investment has paid off in years following. Oh. So we're happy to be doing that and have control of the, really the most uh, 
if you're not putting care into your drawing, then you know what's the point of spending three months drawing this thing? Because that's where your final product is. That's where you're going to get you know the top quality that you can get. And if you if you fail to do that properly, I mean your whole season's a bust. So we really worked hard to to get our airflow going in there. You have some fans up top. We also have uh, carpet carpet fans that we put below with tubes that blow air up vertically. So uh, we have a lot of airflow going on in our in our rooms. Yeah, it is a new industry, but you don't have to spend all your money for the nice equipment, you know, like we improvise. So we it, we dry in an old barn. It's an old barn. It's not a brand new facility. It's nothing like that. But you can see we try to keep it as sterile as possible. We line the ground with plastic, all of our, our walls with plastic. And then as Beryl said, we have these fans. I guess there's one there. You can see the pipe here. And then, yeah. No, I mean it, it it'll so you don't want light to penetrate. Once you have once you have light penetrating, it's gonna cause your color to become more brown. If you dry it in the dark, you get a nice green color. So I mean we're not completely in the dark in our bar by any means, but we try to keep it as dark as we can for that reason. A green, a green buds has better, better appeal to the consumer. So we try to try to do, do our best with that, but um, you could do it in that fashion if you're just doing it for biomass or something. A tobacco one is fine. It's a similar, similar process to it. Yep. You can see there's a lot of airflow. So this, these are all fans up here, lining. Then we have our ground. We probably have about 30 of these carpet fans running 24/7, and we hang them for about two weeks. That two weeks in Bear County, once again, it depends. If we get rain. It might have to sit for a little longer because the, the flower can reabsorb the moisture in the air. Mm -hmm. But typically we hang dry for two weeks and that creates or begins the curing process. So I have a video in the middle here, which is gonna show us a little walkthrough of what we do once we take it off those nets and how we start processing it down. Yeah, so those are our nets, of course. Cheryl, do you wanna talk to me? Yeah, so this is a, a piece of machinery we actually purchased through the Hemp Alliance. We got a grant through a Meridot program to purchase some post-harvest processing equipment. This is basically a chicken plucker that's put on a, a wheel and we use it to, to pull the hemp stalks off. Um, this is a trimmer actually that we use afterwards. Um, this is not our final trim. We usually use, do, use the trimmer for our, our uh, material that's going off to the extractor. It kind of makes it a little bit more potent to get rid of some of that extra leaf matter. Um, so the weight that we're giving to the, the extractor is mostly just CBD flour. A lot of times you'll see the flour being sent to an extractor with all that leaf matter in it. We pull all that out, like I said, and it makes it a really, really nice concentrated uh, biomass that our extractor loves. You can't get it from anyone else, so you buy it exclusively from us. <laughs> um, which is, you know, we're always trying to think how we can do better than than other farms or other other people in the space, and you know. We have a really great partnership with uh, an extractor that we'll talk about here, I think, shortly. Yeah. yeah. So that's the dirty work, essentially. How to get it from the field to a workable product to then add to our product line. Um, and yeah, as Daryl said, one thing I mentioned, all this, this machinery that we have to help us process our raw flour, we've acquired this through grants uh, through our Hemp Alliance. So we have the Mountain Maryland Hemp Alliance up here, which was formed in 2020. We got all the local hemp growers involved. So we have about, what, 12? We had 12. We're down to about five. Actually, okay, we're down to about five. But we had a strong 2020, 2021. The hemp industry is hard. You know, it's, it's a difficult industry to continue through. Um, and we're continuing to write grants as well. So... Now we're at the flower. We went from the plant in the ground to drying and curing, and now we got the flower. Where's the medicine? How do we get to a CBD product? Where are the benefits? I don't get it. So if you look at these pictures, you see all these tiny little dots on the flower. These are zoomed in hemp buds, as you can see at different phases of life. Um, well, you have a, I don't know if this has any. Wow. Well, okay. Um, so the, these little <laughs> tiny dots, that's the medicine. That's where the CBD is. That's where the THC, the CBC, all of those cannabinoids I mentioned earlier are. These little dots, they are called trichomes. Trichomes. Um, 
Yeah. So the trichome, yeah, there's uh, basically a wax. Oh, basically this is what it looks like. My finger with a with a circle on top. This is what it looks like. So that circle is where all of that oil and that medicine is contained that Haley was talking about. Um, so when we're extracting, we're actually extracting from those little those little those little balls actually. So the flower is kind of uh, just covered and coated in this, and you'll you'll you want. I mean, pop culture is you know you get really sparkly bud. The sparkliness is the trichomes that they're talking about. So the more sparkles you have on your bud, the more medicine that's in that flower section. So you guys learned something new. Most <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah. So this is what we're pulling. This is what we're pulling from the plant. And once we have our flower in a certain form, ready for extraction, we send it to our extractor. Extractor. Uh, we partnered, like Daryl mentioned briefly. Um, and it's really interesting how we found our extractor. We have a friend who we served in Peace Corps with. Around the time that we started growing, his cousin started a extraction lab in Wisconsin. He was having a hard time finding reliable hemp in Wisconsin. So our friend connected us to him and asked if we'd send some of our hemp to Wisconsin. We're like, yeah, whatever. All right. Like, we sure. didn't have anywhere to sell We're like, yeah, it. sure. <laughs> so we sent him our hemp products as he loved our flowers. and three years later we're still working with this. He also does uh, what we call in the industry white labeling where you create a product, give it to another company and that company can put their own company label on it. He does that for other companies. He uses primarily and exclusively only our flower. Yeah, so he has uh, five other companies that he's currently white labeling for. So that's great for us because we get to send them more of our flower, helps us grow a little bit more each year. Um, also, it's great for us too that we can get our hemp to be all over this country. We might not even know where it's going, so it's it's, it's pretty neat. Do you want to play some of these videos? Yeah. So this is after the extraction process. Uh, after you extract it using CO2 extraction, um, you'll put it in a freezer, and that's going to separate your waxes, your fats that are in the can cannabis. Um, this is then going to filter out all of that wax and uh, all those wax and fats. This is mixed with alcohol right now currently. So after it comes out of the CO2 extractor, it's like a sludge. Um, you then dissolve that sludge into alcohol, put that into the freezer, separate the waxes, filter it out, and then you take the alcohol solution and remove the alcohol from it. And then you have the pure crude oil that's used to make all the products here. So for the first two years being in business with our extractor, we've never met him. So we actually had the opportunity to go out to Wisconsin last spring to see the lab and meet our extractor. And we had an awesome time. Um, he planned to come out. He was supposed to come out here last year, but it was the time we had COVID, so it didn't happen. Um, but hopefully we can get him out to the farm soon to see, to see the farm in action. So might look familiar. <laughs> so we go from the lab uh, <laughs> to these beautiful products here. So basically when uh, Mitch finishes extracting, he'll make sure that it's a, a, the amount that we want in our product. So for example, our 1260 CBD, uh, it's gonna have 1260 milligrams. So he formulates that to be right around that 1260 mark. Uh, he'll then send it off for lab testing to confirm. And once it's lab tested, uh, to confirm that the, the amount of CBD in it's correct, then we get that product back. Uh, we add all the nice labeling and packaging, um, and then it's off the market. So we have a bunch of different products. You'll see some smokables up in the, in the top corner here, uh, some topical products, which are used directly on your skin where you have pain. Uh, the tinctures are going to be used more for stress, anxiety, a little bit of pain relief, uh, also helps us sleep a lot. Uh, our CBG capsules here, that's used folks with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, that sort of thing, uh, really helps reduce inflammation in the bowels. Uh, we've got some gummy products uh, in our little sampler pack here. Yeah. And, and the will, dog treats. I will yeah. say, uh, we, we do sell hemp flour. You know, hemp flour gets a bad rap and you gotta advocate for it. Hemp is a smokable product. You can smoke it, non-psychoactive. You'll get the relief and benefits, whether it's being relaxed or needing focus, depending on the strain. Um, the flour can also be used to make hemp tea. 
It can be used to make hemp baked goods. Um, you can make a, a hemp butter or CBD butter. So there's a lot of options with the flour. So we, I, lo I love our flour. Uh, we hand trim all of our flour just for that purpose. Um, and then yeah, dog treats because we can't forget about our furry friends at all. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the CBD side. But two years ago, we started branching into the fiber side. Because as Daryl said, that's that's our real goal. That's kind of what we're trying to get to. We love the CBD, but really we want the fiber. Yeah, so as we mentioned before, this has been cultivated since the beginning of time that humans have been doing it 12,000 years ago. Um, so there's, there's really developed industries for fiber hemp in uh, Europe, China, and Canada. Uh, America's way behind all those places because we, again, enacted that law in the 1930s, which kind of eliminated any hemp or cannabis industry here. Um, but there's so many benefits to growing it. Uh, we, we had a, we've grown, as Haley said, two years. Our first year was not so successful. I know some of the people in this room got to see that plot. It was a, a little rough. <laughs> uh, last year though, we actually got a, a, Amazing plot that that grew like this. You can see how how wonderful it looked. Full, well, the weeds were completely gone. We didn't put any pesticides, any herbicides down. These plants grew so quick that it blocked out anything else from growing. So I mean, see for yourself. It does produce flower. Um, so this is probably after the male plants have come up and pollinated the female plants. Right now, in in this picture, you're getting a lot of seed production happening. So after the male plants produce their pollen will basically just all die off in the field. It'll just be remaining female plants with their flower and seeds. So you'll get that pollination occurring at the beginning of July, uh, mid-July. Uh, and then by the end of the season, all, again, all those plants will just die out and you'll be left with a, a field of female plants. So how do you plant, you plant a bunch of female plants and then like one? No, you just have a... <laughs> so yeah, so that's <laughs> Yeah, that's a good there, there, are, there are some slight differences when you're growing hemp for fiber versus hemp for CBD. Um, you can see here, this looks more tall and stringy. Like I said, our girls, they, they like to get big. These, they're like corn. Um, when you're growing for fiber hemp, you can have both male and female plants. You actually want that for seed production. Um, so we actually grow our fiber hemp three miles away from our farm where we grow our CBD. And the reason for that is we don't want the male plants in the fiber plot pollinating our CBD female plants. Uh, that would just destroy our full crop. It would be a very sad day. Um, so we found, uh, we partnered with a local farmer that we used his, his plot of land about two, three miles away from ours. And we don't have that issue at all. <laughs> Thank God. We also found that the, the fiber hemp, uh, it develops much quicker than our CBD hemp. So before the uh, the plants down on our farm, we started producing flowers. These had already pollinated and the males had already started dying down. So I don't even know if it's going to be a, too big of a problem. It's something we don't really want to risk. So yeah. <laughs> we're going to keep them separate. Okay. And we're still Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and we're still learning with the fiber side. The, the genetics, they're starting to become more, uh, I guess, discussed in the U.S. A lot of people get their genetics from Poland. We actually have a variety, a Polish variety that we grew last year, which we're going to grow this year. As of now, I don't believe there's any U.S.-based uh, fiber hemp genetics or varieties. I know in a lot of Canadians. Canada has some. Um, it'll it'll come in time. But they have proven genetics already because they have developed industries. So we're trying to match up with our latitude what, what crops will grow. Um, we, of course, are in the mountains here, so it's going to be different than, say, downstate that's on the same line as us. But um, that's something we're figuring out. We grew three varieties last year, and only one succeeded really well. So Moving forward, we're going to go with this one and try some other ones to see what, see what we can come up with. Oh, before we move on, the strongest natural fiber in the world. That's all I want to say. And, mm -hmm. great, pollen for bees. and great pollen for bees. Yeah, so when you have the male and female plants together, it's good. The bees don't really care about our, our female CBD plants too much. Yeah, but the you, pollen, pollen is really an energy source for bees. It's the protein that they, they take in. It's, they're going to go store that in their hive. 
the hemp plant produces an insane amount. You walk through a hemp field and you'll just be covered in it after, after you come out. So it's a great food source for pollinators. Um, and it's something that I think is overlooked a lot, you know, with, with, with current ag, you have these flowers on say the soy, but the soy flowers are sprayed with all this crap. Right. Mm -hmm. The bees then taking that back to their to their their hive. We don't want that. <laughs> we want a pure honey. And this is this is a way, you know, once we have hundreds and even thousands of acres of this growing in Garrett County, we're gonna have beehives lining those bees. Mm -hmm. right. So we gotta do. Um, so here's the hemp stock. Very strong. Mm -hmm. Going one try four, seven. Yeah. Wow. Let's see. How much do you weigh? I'm I, I weigh two twenty two. All right. So that's hemp fiber. Yeah. So we want we see how strong it is just just right off the finger. Um. So. When I crush this stuff, basically when you're processing this stuff, you can see all this stuff falling out. That's called herd. Herd. H-U-R-D. Herd. This is what you're going to be using for stuff like hemp tree building materials. This is your fiber. I can do a little dance. Um, so this is this is the fiber that you you break down even further you uh, to to create what we make clothes out of a rope. Um, there's quite a process that goes into this. It's not like we can just go, oh yeah, we got a rope. You could make a rope out of it for sure. Um, but prior to it going into the textile industry or into any other, other space, uh, it's going to have to be degummed. In that process, uh, you take something like sodium hydroxide or strong base, you let it soak in it, it removes all that gummy material, uh, ligament in it, and then you can spin it into the yarn like you would cotton or wool. Yeah. Uh, we're working with a company called Tryon Finishing in uh, North Carolina. He basically wants to take hemp fiber and put it on the same spools that are in co that cotton goes on, so they can go to these cotton clothing manufacturers and take his hemp spool and just interchange it with the cotton. So there's no technology that needs to be changed in that facility. It's all Starting off the spool, it's the same as cotton that we can put in, and then you can create blends. Levi's already doing it, you know, 30, 70 blend to have the cotton. Uh, we'd like to get a 50 50 at least, but the amount we can reduce the, the cotton need in this country and replace with hemp, I think that's really the direction you have to go. Uh, that's going to create more opportunities for farmers like us uh, for this industry to grow. I think once it, once it's here, once we start getting some facilities to start actually doing this, there's a lot of prospecting going on, on out there. A lot of people are like, yeah, we're going to, I mean, every year there's another company that's coming to Maryland that's going to do it. They don't pull the trigger ever. They won't pull the trigger. And then for us, for us who have been in it for four years, we are very like, yeah, here's another one of these guys with money that thinks they're going to be farming. They come and talk to farmers like us, and it's just like, they act like we don't know anything, how to get our license, how to do this. It's like, we've been doing this for four years. And, 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 and I'm not trying to be, you know. But you're true. It's yeah, true. I'm not trying to be like, uh, we know everything, but like these guys are just coming into it and be like, they see an opportunity, which is great. And I applaud them for it, but it's like, you're not the right person for this. Like, you don't understand the community. You don't understand how to work with farmers and understand that this is a crop. I hate when people from DC tell me how to farm. It's like <laughs> this guy's like, you got to get it in by April 15th. I'm like, have you ever been to Garrett County? <laughs> <laughs> Who is putting seeds in the ground? I'm just like, this is what they're doing. It's like, you're not going to be able to do it. I'm like, okay. okay. <laughs> also, the varieties, I mean, I ask these people, like, you're, they say, you're going to grow this variety. I'm like, do you know if it'll grow here? <laughs> Well, we think it will grow here because it grows on the latitude that I said, well, you know, our elevation is 3000 feet and we have, it's, it's a very different microclimate than the rest of the state. So, you know, we have to be mindful of that and use the farmer's knowledge to, to build, build your, your company, not try to shove something down your throat and say that this is the way it's going to go. That's not a productive way to do it. So anything we do with this is, you know, we, we have to be flexible. 
any any type of farming or any type of operation, be flexible to the environment and understand that things are going to be different from place to place. And we can't have just one way of doing things. We have to, we have to you know think of all these different uh, external things that may affect the growth. For example, soil type, temperature, humidity, uh, all these things. And you guys have your hands sit, up here too. So. Do you mix it with uh, linen because that linen is very plant-like? Oh well, this is this is very rough. You can get it down to. We'll show you another video up here. It'll be like cotton, soft as cotton. So you can keep on coning this out. You know, make it thinner and thinner. It's going to make it fluffier and more cotton. It's called <laughs> cottonization. Okay. Once you cottonize it, then you can spin it into your tool. Yeah, this is not going to be a quality product. Like I said, you could make quarters. If you were just having it with the zim in a plant, if that's woody, it's almost. So I'm probably I'm, a very similar makeup, much like the flax as well. Um, just a different type of flax. Yeah, flax. Yeah. Flax is a very similar. I mean, you process flax just the same as you do. So okay. we, we utilize a lot of flax options as we're venturing into this this fiber space and trying to break it down. We've been looking at flax processing. There's a lot. Outside. There's a lot more niche growers growing small plots of flax and making very expensive scarves and socks and other things out of it. We actually met an artist last two years ago. Pennsylvania. And she's making like scarves that are this long and this wide, $250. Mm. She grows her own fiber though, dyes it, spins it, and then she makes it into the scarf, which is pretty impressive. It's, but it's impressive. That's kind of where we have to start with something like this. It's find niche art, artisan people who are doing small projects and try to funnel a product to them that they can use in their their uh, project. One such person mm -hmm. um, is a Gary County friend of mine. He moved down to Baltimore. He's a furniture designer. He's trying to create a uh, a piece of furniture that's all local, local material. So he's he's getting wood from uh, fallen trees in Baltimore. Uh, he's getting wool that's discarded from you know someone who's doing sheep. Uh, Thirty, thirty. I'm not thirty, but like. This unsaleable is, stuff yeah. that he's stuffing into for the pads of the seat. Um, he's using hemp as a suspension rope for the seat. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all locally sourced, and he wants this, this uh, chair to have a story. Now, guess how much he's selling this chair for? <laughs> <laughs> Forty-five hundred dollars. So we can find niche products starting out, uh, and he's probably only going to make fifty of those chairs a year. Maybe when he gets to the full production, hundred. So. It's small products like that that we can start getting our, our you know, artisanal hemp into. Um, that's really going to help us start out with 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 all this fiber stuff. And we're we're exploring all different options, but um, he's the first one who's actually taking something he's going to be using it in this project. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so there, there's a wide op, op there's a wide range of options and opportunities for the hemp industry. It's just you know we just got to keep pushing forward. And like so, it's not only just the stock that. You know, you can harvest from a fiber hemp plant. You can also do the seeds. You know, you hear hemp hearts, really good protein source, uh, hemp oil, hemp seed oil uh, that could be consumed or used in beauty products, seed cakes. Um, yeah, there's so many options. And then also herd. We didn't touch on herd, I don't think. Well, I, I said yeah. this is the herd on the ground. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, that's the herd on the ground. So that herd that's supposed to be used for hemp paper, which you know we want to save our forests. Yeah. Not to call uh, Annie out, Annie Simco, but she's making some paper out of our hemp. Oh, you know, so. Yeah, she's doing some experiments. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, this is just only the beginning of all the different options that you can use, make and create using different. Uh, pieces of a hemp plant so stalks leaves flowers seeds <coughs> the list goes on and on one of the cool things and one of the things that daryl and i are most passionate about is bioplastics and figuring out ways probably working with someone else um figuring out ways to get hemp into bioplastic to create bioplastic for single-use plastics going back to that straw you know get a hemp straw single use Another cool thing is there are a lot of companies. There's a handful of companies in the yeah. U.S. Barrel. Can you can you oh, come yeah. over and um some of the yeah yeah. There's a handful of, of companies already in the U.S. doing different hemp fiber products. Uh, there's a company doing wood floors. 
there's a company doing what Daryl's holding right now. Can anyone guess what this might be? Insulation. Insulation. Yeah. So this is the from a company called Hepatexture. Uh, they're out of Minnesota. They are doing a hemp fiber wool blend for their insulation. You can sleep on the stuff. You can get it all under your skin. Let's get rid of that thing stuff. Let's start eating something natural. Uh, this, they have it in different different sizes for different R values. So if you're looking for something that's a little bit more insulated, a thicker thicker uh, insulation. Um, but innovation like this is happening already in America. So there, it's I mean yeah, you can sleep on it. Yes, which is amazing. Uh, the Hempwood floors out of Tennessee are another cool company. Uh, just last year, Hemp Creek got approved as a building material uh, in the United States. So it's coming. It's coming. And the really cool thing about building with hemp is hemp is a carbon sequester. So as I mentioned earlier, it can pull carbon out. So a product like hempcrete, which is if it's used in building materials, that has the chance of continuing to pull carbon dioxide for 50 years. Yeah. So when it's combined with the lime, it's just hempcrete is essentially the herd that's you know, scattered all over the floor uh, mixed with lime and water. Uh, Simple product. There are some other blends that people are putting, maybe a little bit of concrete in it if they're looking for a little harder. It's not going to be structural at all. It's going to be mostly for just insulation. Uh, interior walls can be made out of it as well. Uh, but it's the building material of the future. I mean, you could grow that in your field, not cut down any trees. It's diapers. I, diapers is coming. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a company. Uh, <laughs> wait a second. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I get, get out of yourself. Yeah, he gets good. excited. <laughs> yeah, the endless opportunities. It's just revamping this industry for America, just getting it back up and going. What does bast fibers mean? So bast fiber, bast fibers are the long fibers that we get off of them. So that's that's what we call this. And Can you move over to these bast fibers? Can we? Oh yeah. So this is the fiber that comes off the hemp plant. Uh, with CBD hemp, you're not going to get a straight, long uh, strand like this. You're going to get like a wiry looking uh, knot of fiber. That's why we want to break, grow straight up and down. That allows it to be uh, more functional. Uh, you can cut this at any length. So some industries might want a four inch cut. Some might want a six inch cut. So the longer you can keep it, the, the more versatility you'll have with it in the end and use product. So, um, it's really, once you get processing going, it's really figuring out what the end user wants and then trying to manipulate your equipment to produce a product that that end user can use. It's not gonna be the same for everyone. And obviously we don't have standards yet in America to say, this is what we use for this and this is what we use for that. Um, it's gonna take entrepreneurs and innovators to figure this out, time to figure this out. And that's what journey we're on right now. Yep. <laughs> So this is this is our hemp fiber plot from last season. You can see we plant them very close. We plant it essentially similar to corn. Um, with a drill as well. With a drill, yes. This one's a machine plant, absolutely. Our CBD flower plants, we grow about five to six feet apart so they can, you know, our big girls, they can stretch. These, no, we want them to grow close so that keeps the weeds down and it keeps them growing up, up, up. They're always competing against each other. That's so basically the, the upward growth is that competition that we create with planting and this. How tall do the plants get? Like, what's the tallest plant that you guys get? We've had like nine, ten feet, nine, ten feet. Uh, okay. There's varieties out there that are like 15 to 20 feet. So, that's that's too. Ball who pipe. Yeah. Awesome. We have a new variety we're gonna, planning on growing this year. It's going to be super thick, almost like bamboo. Oh, that's cool. uh, so, hopefully, it grows up here. Yeah, we I mean, have it's, it's really structurally sound. So, just keep yeah, on growing. Exactly. Keep it going. So all that carbon out of the soil in the air and just creating this strong, strong plant. Uh, so that, that's the beginning of summer with those. I think, when did we plant those last year? I think it's June. Yeah. We'll try to get in before before Memorial Day this year. I think it's possible to do. The earlier, the better. Wow, well, it's been <laughs> quite mild this spring. Yeah. So this was the end, yeah, the end product. Like Daryl mentioned, we had some that got to about nine feet. I mean, if you look behind us, like there, 
They're tall. They're taller than me, but not like. I'd say yeah. average. We're gonna wait five to six feet yeah. in this room. <laughs> yeah. And uh, like we said, we do everything manual. <laughs> so Terrell and I decided to go cut a couple stocks down ourselves and realized okay. that we need machinery. <laughs> Keep lying. We didn't cut this whole field down. Anymore. No. This is going to take too long. So then we had to find the piece of equipment uh, to try to cut it down a sickle bar mower. Uh, we ended up buying one that didn't work, uh, Lancaster. And, and then, of course, Lily Lance helped us out and, <laughs> and brought one of his down and we used that and it, it worked out great. Yeah, we're still learning on the fiber yeah. stuff. Uh, but it is an emerging industry, as we've mentioned. Alternative bioplastics, carbon sequestration, strong, more durable than cotton, all the good stuff for hemp. Last year, we had the opportunity to travel to Colorado and visit a hemp processing company that the guy actually came up here when we did some uh, grant work. Uh, so he has equipment for processing hemp. So we got to go out there and see his equipment in action, the field, and we only grow like a couple acres out in Colorado. They're growing thousands, That's thousands, two hundred of acres. acres. Wow! So this is just a little uh, snippet of our Colorado. I have to do one thing. Everyone's like, "Hey, you're gonna cut it down like hay, put it in rows, and let it sit out." Um, this is the process. Is Basically, bail it up, unwrap it, and then sorting it out the bird the environment. Kind of what we hope to bring a lot of this, like this in Bear County, that we can eventually expand upon, start out small, uh, but then add other machinery on the scale. So, their, their machinery allows them to do that. So increasing your capacity year on year is definitely possible by just adding more pieces. Can you tell the end products? Yeah. So uh, one of the cool products that we had there was 300 pound bales of cotton like that. Where the heck are these guys? Uh, so they, they, they cottonize it, the hemp, make it really, really uh, fluffy. So it's just like cotton, really soft. They put it into a cotton baler and they make this large bale. And then he was sending it off to a baby wipe company. So they're going to make a non woven baby wipe from hemp. So I mean, there is endless possibilities. And, and once we have processing, we can, we can search out these <coughs> innovators and entrepreneurs, get our product into their hands, and start, you know, start this green economy really from the ground up. You know, it's so great for like landfills for like. Yeah. Something that decomposes, that's the key. End of life for the product. Everything we make has been made out of plastic since the 1930s. It's, wow. And it's still sitting in the oceans and yeah. in the ground. It's not decomposed yet. With this, we can have breakdown in less than a year, 180 days in some of the products. Um, we actually have our pre roll tubes and our uh, Gummy packaging, these are all made with plant based plastics that decompose. This will decompose in 180 days. The plastic container is a little bit longer time, five years ago. This is enzyme driven plastic. Uh, basically, the enzymes in it, uh, once it gets mixed into the soil, helps to break down the plastic in a much shorter time. So, we're always trying to be conscious of this and, you know, well, the tech well. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. Yeah, yeah. we got to get away from uh, petroleum based yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, we'll do more bio based yeah. So yeah. that's what we're doing. So, yeah, so that we want that machinery one day mm -hmm. with one grant, we will get it. Um, but until then, we know we just keep uh, doing our own research and development. Uh, so, that lovely hemp field that we had, we got to get a few hemp bales out of it. So, off of our a little under one acre of our fiber hemp. We got two and a half round bales. Wow. <laughs> it was only about a third of the acre that we had this ground that actually worked. We had the other two varieties of our half field that didn't really grow, so it's down there. But it was a 
this was so exciting for us. It's concept proven. We used the hay bale and the bale stuff. So we didn't go out and buy new pieces of wood. This is the, what the guy who bales the hay on our farm uses. So that's what we're trying to do is not reinvent the wheel, but uh, utilize uh, the infrastructure that's currently available on our farms and uh, leverage that to really get this done. Um, yeah, and these are just some of the different products. Uh, these are taken to Colorado, but just the different styles. So this city, this photo on the left, that is like a very soft option that could be used for those non-woven lights, what have you. What you have in the middle, that is herd, which is again the inside of that fiber stock that could be used for animal bedding, paper products, um, hemp hempcrete, the list goes on and on. And then this last one is just a video. Since we haven't really done much seeds, we want to eventually do seed collection. We just didn't get around to it last year. Um, but this is essentially how the seeds come off of those fiber plants. It just comes in the flower on the top and then, you know, just agitate it a bit and then you get your hemp seeds out of it. Mm -hmm. So typically if you wanted to harvest the hemp seeds, this is, this is the real like tricky thing about hemp. For fiber, you got to, harvest your fiber before the seed production begins. Uh, so you're not going to get seeds if you're growing from fiber. Um, since we're in these beginning phases, we're just like, oh, like brown and the all that. This is low quality fiber. It wouldn't be used for textiles, but maybe ropes. Um, but basically you'd have a combine come through and top all of the plants where the seeds are. Uh, that would separate your seed out and then you'd have that product to start. And once you did that, then you'd go and cut the plant down um, to begin the reading process. The reading process is basically what allows that hemp fiber to come off. Um, if anyone cuts down like a locust tree, uh, you'll notice after about a year that the bark will start peeling off. Um, that's basically a, a microbial process that's happening. The bark sticks to the, the log. Um, in the case of hemp, it's ligament that holds it. See how it's coming off like this? Uh, we let it lay out in the field like, hey, you don't want to get wet. Hemp, we want to get wet. We need it. We need it to sit for about a month's time. And the more it rains on it, the more that microbial process can happen. And that microbial process is breaking down the ligand between the fiber and the stalk. Um, so once you take it in for decortification, we can get the fiber away from the stalk. Either. Now, if we don't let that process happen, much with our like we do with our CBD crop, uh, you don't have that separation happening, so you can't really get the fiber off of it. Um, so it is a very important portion of the, the, the whole process. Um, but uh, like Kelly said, we're, we're constantly learning and trying to figure out what we actually want to do. I think next year, we're going to try to do some seed stuff. Uh, I think this next grant that we want to put in is going to be for some seed, a seed press uh, to start making hemp seed oil, which is not only nutritious, but it's used in a lot of cosmetics, shampoos, and that sort of thing. Um, so we want to see to start experimenting with that a little bit this year. Yeah. So we've covered CBD, hemp, fiber, everything we've seen, we've done it, or we're working towards it. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit. If you'll still have this talk, I know we're over. Yeah, we're a little over. This, this is... So we all know 2020 through July 1st, 2023, recreational marijuana is coming to Maryland. What does this mean? What's going on? <laughs> Um, so a little timeline of marijuana for Maryland. In 2014, medical, medical cannabis was legalized in Maryland, which is what we all know today, is medical industry. You have to have a license for whatever ailment you may have, and you can purchase at local dispensaries. In 2016, SB 517 criminalized cannabis paraphernalia in Maryland. And you start to see this pattern in 2017, the MMCC, which is the Maryland Marijuana uh, Control Commission, something like that. Like the Marijuana Control. Yeah, something like that. It's an acronym. Um, they started operating and regulating the cell. They're registered medical patients. And then, of course, in 2021, we started this proposal of adult use recreational legalization. And then last year, of course, in November, we were uh, the voters approved to pass the referendum at 65.5% for it, 34.5% against. And of course, everyone knows how Garrett County leaned <laughs> on that. 
Which is nice. Twenty eight percent. I think that was actually better than I thought. We yeah. Give it was pretty close. Um, but we know there's probably gonna be some pushback once it starts coming, you know, back to life here. But yeah, so we're to educate. Yeah, right. so come uh, July. Yeah, so July first, it will be legal. It's not legal now. July first. So that means anyone over 21 years of age can go to a dispensary or a recreational dispensary once they're available and buy cannabis. You can also grow up to two plants per household. So it's exciting. Does not mean marijuana is legal federally. It will still be illegal federally. Uh, so it'll only be for Maryland. So we're gonna ask a couple questions here. Can I purchase cannabis products? I just covered that one. Yes, starting July 1st. <laughs> Exciting. Uh, the closest dispensaries to Garrett County that will most likely have the opportunity for recreation come July 1st, most likely will be Grow West and Allegheny. These are the two closest ones and they're both in Cumberland. And mind you, there's no new license to be coming out July 1. So how the industry is working it, uh, folks that are currently in the cannabis space and in the medical side, can convert their licenses to recreational. So they paid 8% uh, off their gross for last, the last year. So say they made a million bucks last year, they'll pay $80,000 to convert their, their license to be able to sell rent, which most places are probably going to end up doing. Um, like many states who approved recreational marijuana, there wasn't facilities set up to sell when it became legal, which created problems for you know a number of reasons. But um, Maryland decided to allow these people in the medical space to, to have first go at it because they're already there. I understand. Um, new licensing, though, are you going to go over that? And then, all right, we'll talk about the new licenses. <laughs> uh, can I grow my own plants? Yes. Two plants per household. If you have three adults in a household, no, you cannot grow six plants. <laughs> if you do, it's on you. Um, can I smoke cannabis in public? Does anyone know the answer to this? Uh, they're trying to figure it out, I think. Yeah. You know, no. In the county, I don't think they need to know. In Maryland, no. Yeah. No public places. It will, will be prohibited. You will be fined. I think the fine, the first offense was 250. 100 or 200. And then the second, it, it just keeps going up and up. So at your own risk, of course, but if it's prohibited in any public place, place or any vehicle. This includes parks, public transportation, bars, restaurants, sidewalks, streets. Um, so that will still be private property. Private property. Can I travel outside of Maryland with cannabis? No. It's still legal under federal law. So it's only for the state of Maryland. Uh, Will past marijuana possession charges be expunged under this new bill? Anyone know? Probably not. Ooh, mixed room. Interesting. Yes, it will be, but it won't be automatic. Um, it allows individuals convicted to request expungement uh, after successful completion of the sentence. Yeah, I feel like they're still trying to work out the kinks on this one. Um, it seems like a lot of people with this new bill are so focused on the recreation. Where can I buy? Where can I get? That they're really not focusing as much as they should be on the important things. Mm -hmm. But um, it's at least a step in the right direction. Okay, so the licensing, I just thought they're all getting to this. Knock yourself out. Yeah, I'm not going to go into this completely. I'm going to just briefly go over some of the stuff that's going to be happening. So as I said before, July 1, these medical cannabis facilities are going to be able to convert to recreational licenses. Uh, for social equity for social equity areas, uh, they haven't really defined what that means yet. Uh, basically, or what those areas are, I'm not sure if Garrett County is even going to be included in that because our arrests probably don't meet their standards, all based on marijuana arrests, essentially. Um, so, those are going to be available uh, January one. I've heard I've heard rumor that the social equity licenses might be starting in. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> might be starting out in uh, September or October. We'll see what the legislation says about it. You know, it's they've just been a mess this year over stuff. I mean, we've gone through 
a lot in the last few months that I'll touch on in a minute too. Um, there's going to be secondhand applications for general public. Uh, that's probably going to come third or fourth. Yeah, beginning beginning of next year, 2024. So you're not going to really see any other new businesses coming online until probably 2025. Uh, so there is going to be a gap, and that's what where the medical dispensaries are going to be covering that gap. Um, so types of licenses, they're going to be having standard grower licenses, uh, or 20 grower, 40 processor, and, and 80 dispensary. That's the standard licensing. Then they're going to do the micro dispensaries uh, or micro, micro growers, processors, and dispensaries. Basically, the classification of those is how many employees you have, how much canopy space you can grow in, and uh, how you can sell it. These micro dispensaries are only going to be for delivery service only, uh, and there's only going to be 10 awarded in the state. Uh, 10 incubator spaces. Those incubator spaces will be public consumption areas. Um, right now, doesn't look like you're going to be able to smoke cannabis in public in these places, but they will allow consuming of edibles and that sort of thing in, in these incubators. Yeah, they're still fine tuning some things. We've been trying to keep up to date as best we can, but this is the most up to date information. Ever. So that first round is for social equity folks. Um, that's what they have allotted for that group. Uh, down below the second round, that's when the rest of the licenses are released. 25 grower, 25 processor, 120 dispensary licenses. Um, and then the micro dispensaries, micro licenses, the 70 grower, 70 processor, and 190 dispensaries. So that's a pretty, there's a, there's a pretty large pool of uh, opportunity out there, but there's probably going to be a lot of people applying for this. So it's all lottery based as well. So you pay your application fee. $5,000 and hope you get it. Non-refundable. Non -refundable. That's the real the real kicker to all that is you, 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 you might end up paying $15,000 and not even get a license in the end. So who keeps the money? <clears throat> the state, the new Just cannabis the commission. Yeah. Um, what a racket. Yeah, it's definitely a racket. Expensive lottery balls. Yeah. That is a like very that. Long expensive <laughs> lottery. Yeah. And, and there's no place for growers like us who have been playing by the rules in the hemp space for three years. We don't have any special in. There's no benefit given that we, I mean, we've proven ourselves to, to put out a high quality premium product. Um, you'd think that they would yeah. give us preferential treatment in this space, but you know, that's just not the way it goes. And unfortunately, we will be flying like anyone else. Oh, I ruined it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> will we apply for a recreational cannabis license? Daryl, will you? <laughs> I guess we will. Yes, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be applying for all three. Actually, we're gonna be applying for uh, a grow license, probably a micro grow with ten thousand square feet of canopy space, which is a quite a large amount. Um, we'd also apply for a micro processor, which allows for processing of a thousand pounds of cannabis per year, which is more than enough. Uh, with our current product line, we process probably two hundred pounds, um, and that's more than enough for what we're doing. Um, Having a vertically integrated operation would be the dream that we can have a grow operation that feeds into a processor that then feeds into a dispensary. Uh, that would be the ultimate goal. We're going to apply for all three in case we don't get one or the other. You know, if we get all three, amazing. But um, we're going to leverage our experience with our current extractor in Wisconsin. He would likely come help us out with uh, setting that lab up, and we partner with him. Uh, the grow space technical stuff with the grow space we're professionals in that so we can do that on our own on uh, the dispensary i mean we'll figure that out too yeah. <laughs> keep this in your thoughts I should, I should, I should. absolutely do you think uh with the marijuana coming along is that going to happen so great question yeah so uh, can you repeat the question uh he asked with the recreational marijuana coming along is that going to impact the industry so yeah we've been worried for about three months now that if we'd actually be able to continue our business after july one um we however have only been doing a nine nine psychoactive product um a lot of the hemp industry has been lumped into this delta a thco uh delta 10 these are all synthetic cannabinoids you cannot oh. grow them so there's been a lot of misinformation out there uh the public thinks that it's hemp yeah. They're basically taking our CBD and uh, taking a, a solvent that they've created in the lab with that CBD and spraying it on the flower mm -hmm. and they call it Delta 8 flower. So you're not technically, you're not smoking a natural thing. You're smoking a lab produced synthetic compound. So we've been lumped into that great 
group of people that have been making tons of money these past few years on that. We decided that we would be purists with what we're doing. We only sell what we can produce on our farm. We only sell what we can extract from our plants. We're not trying to adulterate what mother nature has given us. Yeah. Um, and there's been so much misinformation about the hemp industry out there that people are thinking we're growing Delta 8 flower and you're growing the, it's like, if you only knew, if you only knew where that's coming from. And a lot of this stuff could be purchased anywhere. You'll see the gas stations because yeah. uh, it's unregulated. Um, so they, they've come down really hard on the hemp industry, mostly on the psychoactive side. So I, I just had a conversation with the Secretary of Ag yesterday and uh, he says we can keep doing what we're doing. Um, we'll have to follow the rules of based on the potency for our tinctures. All of our stuff falls within the limits that they set out within that legislation. It's a one to, or it's a 15 to one ratio in CBD to THC. Most of our products are 25 to 50 to one CBD. So we aren't falling in that high THC category that, that they're, they're, they're mostly wanting to get these, these psychoactive products out of, out of gas stations where people aren't educated on what they are. I know so many people who have consumed it. They're like, I'm taking a hemp gummy thinking they're getting CBD and then they're in outer space in a, an hour or two and just can't function, you know, where they're driving to work, they take a hemp gummy, but it's Delta eight and they can't work because they're, <laughs> they're intoxicated. And uh, this has been kind of a sneaky thing that the industry has done uh, to allow, not to allow, but people have figured out a way to, to make a lot of money off. They still call it hemp and get people high. So people are coming and purchasing it. I mean, because they don't have access. Mm -hmm. And that's a key point we need to talk about is like, there isn't access to cannabis for folks. I mean, you have to you have to pay for the doctor, you have to get the license, so you're already $300 to even get a medical license. Mm -hmm. A lot of these folks were going to Delta 8 because it's readily available. Mm -hmm. It's it, They're able to consume it without having to get all these extra, extra things. So, I mean, it's beneficial for that, but now that Rex here, why would you use a synthetic compound to do the same thing? And that's that's really where we saw things going is like, why are we trying to produce something synthetic if we're, if we're trying to eventually, you know, have legalization occur, there's going to be no space for it, really. And these people will claim that, yes, there is a space for it. Maybe there is. But from our perspective, if you can't produce it naturally, why, why are you trying to why are you trying to peddle this as medicine? We won't need loopholes come July 1st. Yeah. yeah. So we're. we're our, the way we started our business and to where we got now, I mean, it was really scary with this legislature. I mean, I wrote letters to legislators, testified, all this stuff to like, like, don't be saying this in here because the way it was worded initially, all of our products would be gone July 1. You'd have to have a dispensary license to sell it, um, which yeah. we don't have. So <laughs> basically we're out of business come July 1. But uh, as we dug into it a little bit more and, you know, done the math on our products, we're still compliant. So. Should we get to go? Huh? Trying to get on the side of the NFL. And... <laughs> so, do you see anything in the federal horizon? Oh, yeah. In terms of federal legalization, it's hard to say if there's any, if we see anything. I, I don't see it coming. Because it'll just like the soon. money. Because if it's federal, isn't like everything has to be cash or. So there, there, there's, there's a safe banking act that's mm -hmm. recently been passed that's going to help cannabis, the cannabis space be able to get banking. I mean, even as a hemp business, we had the hardest time getting the bank account in 2019. Things have changed a lot in those amount in that amount of time. But for for the cannabis space in general, it's definitely hard to get loans or uh, to have a savings account with them. So a lot of the businesses are are finding ways to adapt. Basically, they'll They'll take a credit card or debit card and use like use it like an ATM. So if you have a bill of $91 or we'll round it up to the closest $5 or $10 and then give you that change back. So they're technically using wow. I mean, yeah. they're these yeah. these loopholes that people are trying to figure out, but it is it is hard to get everything cash all the time. So the safe banking act should help to eliminate some of those issues. So we have a couple of Zoom uh, questions. Um, Sam, if you wanted to unmute anybody that has a question on Zoom, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, Sharifa, do you want to unmute? Wait, say again? Go, go ahead and ask some of your questions, Sharifa. <laughs> um, first of all, very great presentation. Okay, um, I have kidney disease, so what 
do you have or could you make anything to help regulate that more? I mean, <laughs> and um, I couldn't remember my other question. I have to go look at it. <laughs> oh no, it was good. It was about asking about how this is going to affect the industry, and I and I think they did get into that actually. Yeah, they um, did. All the legislative changes, yeah. yeah. So going back. And you also asked okay, why you why cut you down. That you cut down the um, plants and regrow them, replant them every year. What is the purpose of that? Uh, they just don't come again. You cut them and they're done. They die. They won't regrow. They won't regrow. So, oh, at all at all? We're not. We're, yeah, they're all female all. plants, so they're not. They're not producing any seeds or oh, anything like that. So you did say that the male plants die out. You and kind it's of think here. of it like a tomato plant, essentially. If you plant a tomato plant at the beginning of summer, you get your tomatoes, and then that plant's not going to grow back. It's very similar to that. We'll grow it. We'll get the flower off of it, and then replant. Now the fiber on the other side. Uh, all the animals love eating hemp seeds, so oh, yeah. you're gonna start seeing hemp plants popping up all over the place, I'm sure, in the next few years. Oh, girls okay. taking them, birds taking them, like they're dropping them here and there. Oh, yeah. Uh, also, like within our field, we'll see plants growing back in the fiber hemp field the following year, but uh, not so much with the CBD. Um, yeah, I've okay. had some compost plants pop up. Are there any bugs that? And you answered my other question. I used to be, I used to be on, have a, a. a ID for um, CBD, and it's like it was just too expensive to keep it. They yes. charge you an arm Absolutely. and a leg, first of all, to go to the doctor to get the ID, then to go to the dispensaries to get what they ask, they prescribe to you, is just ridiculously expensive. Absolutely, and you know the cool thing about cannabis recre uh, recreational cannabis coming online, we're going to help people learn how to make their own medicine with the plant that they grow at their house. You know, how do we make an oil that we can use in oh, yeah. um, my cooking or my, me up for that you know, class. I can put in capsules. So we want to, we want to be a source for people, not only to, to provide a great product, but also to teach people how to make their own medicine that they can't afford to go buy. Cause that's, that's key. And there's, there's so much you can do in your house with, with the raw plant that you can do, you know, a lot of the stuff we're doing here. Um, but it's going to cost you significantly less if you do it on your own. So we want to we want to be a, an outlet for people to learn how to you know make proper medicine and clean medicine for themselves um, out of the plants that they're growing at their house. Yeah. Well, thank you. One more slide. Real quick, um, I just wanted to do a quick plug. We do farm tours in the summertime. We are five miles down the road from here. So whether NAACP wants to all come together or if people have family or friends in town we, we do our we do our stores you see an yeah. LHB bus yeah. yeah what do you all do when you need volunteers like how do you get the word out like if someone wants to come and volunteer or get a group to we will reach them. out directly to you we don't typically post online for you know we don't want a lot of people but True. if you guys are interested in a work day we can try to figure something out absolutely and then is there an age limit for working on the farm? Or a minimum age. Like if your parents are fine with it, then we're fine with it. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. Typically it's it's 18 years of age, but with the parent, yeah, we both yeah. Uh but yeah, so farm tours, uh, as you can see, dogs and children are welcome. Uh, we walk around the farm, we tell the history, you get to touch the plants, um, see the barn. It's a it's just look how big that farm is. It's, it's a good <laughs> thing. Yeah. It's something else to do. Um, yeah, so that's the end. I will say we put a raffle at the back of the room. If you didn't put your name in the jar already, I suggest you do. Well, yeah, Mima, uh, put my name in, please. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I think I think we included everybody other, online too. If there's any other questions, yeah, just let us know. What's uh what's the status with I, edibles? Does it fall in the same category as other kind of be words? So ed edibles has been an interesting topic for Maryland, at least for CBD. It's fine as long as we stay under the THC limit. Um, with cannabis or marijuana, it's fine, but they'll probably have limits on the milligram of THC in them. Yeah. Now the thing that's interesting is uh, marijuana or cannabis in like consumables, like drinks. 
or a dish, like say a restaurant or a coffee shop, you can't go to a coffee shop in Maryland and ask for a CBD latte or a THC latte. There's still limits on that right now, but all edibles, it's just going to be a, a dose limit on it. And I saw some advertising, I was surprised, I saw some advertising online for it. So it can be shipped within the state or it can be shipped across the state lines? CBD can be shipped all over the country. Uh, oh, so, THC, no. So, oh, okay. So it's THC specific prohibitions. Correct. Yeah. So like for our products, because we, we fall under the hemp industry, so it's a separate licensing, we can ship our products to all over the country. And we ship from Florida, California, uh, Arizona, we ship all over. But the recreational marijuana, it'll just be state, state based. I'd like to. Can I? Yeah, could I just ask that the um in the room, if if you could just yeah. limit it to one person speaking, because we can't hear when there's other conversations in the room. Yeah, yeah. I remember when you asked. Yeah. Um, can I say something? Just wait one second. Okay. Pest and bugs. So we don't have too many issues with pest and bugs on our plants. Um. The only big issue we have is when they're small, when they're below a foot to 12 inches or a foot to 16 inches. We have rabbit and uh, rabbit issues and groundhog issues. They will come through and pops off the top. We've lost hundreds of dollars of plants in the last years because of one groundhog. Mm. Yeah, we do. Yeah, she's working on it. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for the presentation. It was really great. And I'd like to give to everybody else a real plug for their rescue bomb. It's been a rescue for me. A fabulous product. Thank you. It's a really fabulous product. For muscle, for muscle pain, referred pain, and I'm a physical therapist. I tell you, it was a great product. Yeah, we got so, go to it. <laughs> this is the product she's referring to. Fabulous. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, this one's one Thank of our you. most popular products. I didn't I didn't podcast. believe in anything and it's really been marvelous. Appreciate it. Thank Are there you. any other online questions? Yeah. Any in the room questions? Oh, where can you find our products? Yes. So we have here our website, metamountainhemp.farm. Daryl has some cards he's passing out. We are on social media. We are also at the local farmers markets here in the summertime, the Mountain Fresh Farmers Market in Oakland on Saturdays. We are there. And then we're also at the Deep Creek Farmers Market here at the college on Fridays, starting Memorial Day weekend. And we ship products all over. We also do delivery in Garrett County, straight to your house, faster than Amazon, usually. <laughs> usually. Yeah, where's Daryl? Hey, Daryl. Yeah. All right, so we're going to do the raffle here. Lovely assistant up here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I put you talking about me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 All right, so we're giving away some do, should we get an item. I the camera. There's the camera. Oh, it's pointed on. Uh, <laughs> to make them jealous. Uh -huh. yeah. Laura Robinson. Oh, oh, Laura Robinson. Yes. Yay, Laura. Yay. Some Trapagen gummies. <laughs> and also a sample of our tincture and our water. We're not done yet, though, so hold on. Wow. All right. Who's the next? I know where I'm going to go this weekend. Uh, <laughs> Devin. Right now. I'm going to pick something else. You don't count. 
All right, online winner. Here it is. Uh, she she logged out. We lost quite a few of the online participants. It was um just hard to hear at the end. So Harriet. Harriet. So Harriet's the winner? She's yeah. Harriet, I can get it. We'll, we'll, we'll deliver it. Yeah. Okay. So if anyone has her contact or her address, like, yeah, she lives at yeah, Red yeah. Run. Perfect. All right. Maybe. Congrats, Harriet. We have one more. We have one more. <laughs> Ella online. <laughs> All right, we're gonna do another one to get someone in this room. Somebody in the room. But we'll yeah. we'll let Ella get it. Yes. Okay. Ella and Harriet. Is Ella still on the line? They both bounced. Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll get their contacts. Elaine. Hey. Hey. Uh, -huh. If anyone wants to try down here, you think you want to let you try up here. Um TBD isolated full spectrum gun so. Yeah, I got to test. They're amazing. So thank you, everyone, for listening to us. I know we went a little over time. Thank you for your coming and supporting us. Great. All right. Thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, you know, just to reintroduce myself. I'm I'm president. I'm Devin Broga, president of GCNWA. And uh, just to give you kind of a rundown of what our organization is about. I'm sorry, Devin. Can you just hold on? We can't actually hear because there's someone chatting in the background. Okay. Well, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? We can hear you, but there's this background noise that's making it hard to hear. Okay. Well, I'm just going to give a rundown of what Garrett County NAACP is about. Um, we represent the last county to form a chapter here in Maryland. Uh, we chartered in 2021 and we hit the ground running. And ever since then, we've, we've uh, doing some really big things in the county. Um, you know, some points of accomplishments include uh, nearly $23,000 uh, fundraised for our NAACP Scott Robinson uh, College Scholarship. Uh, we've also been working closely with all the mayors in Garrett County to work on an anti-hate vendor guidelines and resolution for the county to ensure safe and welcoming events for everybody in the county. And we also run one of the largest, uh, one of the most visited Facebook accounts uh, in the nation of its kind with 135,000 monthly visitors. So I don't say this stuff to brag. I say this, we're doing big things in little Garrett County with a small group of membership. And, you know, we, we'd love to invite you to become members. So if you're interested, we have Adele Naylor. She's right back there. She's our membership chair. If you want to sign up, she can take care of you. She can do the paper form. We can do it on the phone, whatever works best for you guys. But um, yeah, yeah, we're a small but mighty chapter. And, we, you know, we continue. We want to continue to grow with the community and uh, get all you guys involved. So thank you for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you.